And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. The impact of treaty making in Canada has been wide ranging and long standing. The treaties the Crown has signed with Indigenous peoples since the 18th century have permitted the evolution of Canada as we know it. In fact, much of Canada's land mass is covered by treaties. On today's Open Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 2000. We have a treaty. The Niska people have been waiting more than 100 years to hear those words. In fact, self-government was always the goal, starting when Niska chiefs traveled to Victoria in 1887 to demand the negotiation of treaties. The white settlers and their government had taken over the land and made the Niska subject to their law and their rules. In 1927, uh, the government uh, uh, made it illegal for, for any Indians to talk about the resolution of the land question here in British Columbia. It was illegal. The Parliament of Canada later repealed the legislation allowing natives to pursue land claims. But the Niska made little progress until they went to court in 1968. The Niska Tribal Council and its president, Frank Calder, took the case to the Supreme Court of Canada. British justice is on trial. But the Calder case turned out to be only a partial victory in 1973. The Supreme Court unanimously recognized that Aboriginal title had existed at least up to the time of European contact. But the seven judges were split on whether this title had been extinguished. In effect, the highest court in Canada had thrown the ball back to the politicians, and the politicians decided to run with it. The federal government recognizes the importance of these claims and the importance of bringing all the parties involved to the table. The federal government's about face was largely political. The land claim question was becoming a major political problem right across Canada. He was head of the minority government at that point in time. He was afraid he was going to be brought down on this issue alone. So he had to initiate a land claim comprehensive policy which began all the negotiations throughout Canada. The provincial government had long insisted Aboriginal title had been extinguished. But regardless of that, in 1990, the provincial government formally joined Canada and the Niska Tribal Council at the negotiating table. Now that the uh, provincial government is in negotiations with us, we're, we're looking forward to having formal discussions in those areas. And yes, we do have a concern that while we're negotiating um, what, what we're hoping to include, say, in the final packets may be all gone by the time we're finished negotiating. While the Niska waited for full-fledged treaty negotiations, they had gained some degree of control over two issues. Through agreements with the federal and provincial governments, a Niska-run school board and health board were established. The relationship between the Niska and the province also seemed to be improving when the Niska Memorial Lava Bed Park was officially opened in April of 1992. The project was a joint venture between the natives and Victoria. We have some provincial funding at the moment and uh, we are looking toward corporations uh, to provide us with some assistance in, in funding some areas. But it wasn't until 1996, after many years of talking, that the Niska and the two levels of government came to an agreement. The agreement in principle was initialed on March 22nd, which formed the basis for the first modern-day treaty. The details of the treaty were finally worked out in an agreement in Terrace where emotions were running high. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. The Nisqua Final Agreement is the first treaty in British Columbia to provide constitutional certainty in respect of the Aboriginal People's Section 35 right to self-government. It recognizes Nisqua lands and opens the door for joint economic initiatives in the development of Nisqua Nation's natural resources. Let us return to the archives to discover two lands outlined in the treaty. 
Two kinds of lands are included in the treaty. The first, a contiguous parcel referred to as Niska lands. Runs from uh, Dragon Lake to my to the north on to the north of New Iance, all the way down to the community of uh, Kincoleth. And uh, all of the forest resources within that area will be owned by the Niska people, including any mineral rights that uh, will be found on the land. Niska lands do not include existing private property or agricultural leases, woodlot licenses, or the Niska Highway. Existing rights of way also continue. In addition, existing trap lines, guide outfitter licenses, and angling guide tenures remain under provincial jurisdiction. The second kind of lands in the treaty are described as Niska fee simple lands outside the Niska lands. They consist of 18 Indian reserves and 15 parcels of crown land. Some of them are in the Portland Canal Observatory Inlet area. Some of them are north around the Miziad and the Ginsburg area. And uh, certainly we, uh, we have chosen these small pieces of land uh, for economic reasons. We believe that we can uh, create some employment for our people. It's up to the, uh, the tribal council and the villages that will own the Nishka lands as to whether or not they will uh, sell them or what exactly they will do with them, but it's their decision. It's no longer a decision of uh, the government of Canada. The treaty also gives the Niska a commercial recreation tender, and it designates a Nass wildlife area where the Niska have hunting rights. The Niska Memorial Lava Bed Park remains a Class A provincial park, and a new Bear Glacier provincial park will be created. These will be jointly managed uh, by the parks brands uh, and uh, our people. We also have an ecological reserve uh, downriver across from the Lava Bed Memorial Park, and again, that will be managed by, by our people. Non-Niska residents of the Northwest, as well as tourists, have enjoyed the forests and streams of the Nass Valley while it's been crown land. Many have worried they'll be shut out when that land changes hands, but the Niska say no. I'm very pleased to say that what we have arranged here is quite unique in British Columbia. Uh, when you compare it to other private land holders in British Columbia, normally people don't allow each other to roam on other people's land. Well, in this treaty, we have uh, uh, access provisions that will allow the general public to have access to, to our land. Uh, certainly, uh, the recreational uh, fishing that takes place w will continue uh, until uh, such time that it can be reviewed by uh, our, our government that will come into force. They will remain unaffected. The so Niska government may there. make laws regulating public access for yes. the purposes of public safety, uh, protection of the environment, yes. cultural or historic features. Some lands will also be treated as private lands. They include village lands and other lands in which the Niska government creates an exclusive interest or where public access would interfere with uses such as commercial, cultural, or resource development. The forests are one of the richest resources within the Nass Valley, and there's bitterness among many Niska over how much timber they've witnessed trucked out of their traditional territories for the benefit of others. They're hoping this treaty will finally allow them to protect the resource and enjoy the income and jobs the forest industry can create. The Niska will own all the forest resources on Niska lands, but for the first five years, existing licenses will remain in effect. In addition, the province has agreed in principle to the Niska purchasing forest tenure with an allowable annual cut of up to 150,000 cubic meters. The Niska can't establish their own primary processing plant for 10 years. The idea is to give companies now using timber from the area time to adjust their operations or reach agreements with the Niska. The Niska government will also be able to set forest management standards on Niska lands. Many Niska still see their futures tied to the Nass River salmon, so fishing provisions make up an important part of the treaty. 
The NISCA will receive an annual allocation of Canadian NAS salmon. It'll be a percentage based on the total allowable catch set by the federal government, and average approximately 26%. That amount is made up of an allocation under the treaty, plus an outside harvest agreement for pinks and sockeye that doesn't have the same treaty protection. When you compare the percentage that we get, uh, our view is that it doesn't pose a threat to the current uh, commercial sector, neither does it pose a threat to the recreational area. Uh, all we have indicated is uh, uh, we don't want the whole pie. We want a piece of the pie. Since time immemorial, we've depended on the salmon. Because you will notice that all the reserves, we call reserves now, are situated where there's, uh, there's habitats. And that's the reason why, the easy access of the salmon. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Beginning in the early 1970s, successive court cases confirmed that indigenous rights and title are legal rights and they existed whether the governments recognized them or not. In 1982, the Constitution Act included Section 35, a provision that recognizes and affirms existing indigenous and treaty rights. Let us return to the archives to discover some of those rights. In any year the Department of Fisheries deems there shouldn't be any fishing because there aren't enough salmon returning, the Niska fishery will be closed along with the commercial and recreational fisheries. In order for Niska fishers to secure a larger role in the general commercial fishery, the federal and provincial governments will provide $11.5 million dollars it will be used largely to help the NISCA buy vessels and licenses from present fishers willing to sell them. The NISCA foresee establishing their own processing facilities to get more value out of their catch. However, they cannot establish a large-scale processing plant for eight years. As with forestry, the idea is to give existing processors time to adjust to the changes. As for other aquatic species, the NISCA will have the right to harvest steelhead and other fish and shellfish for domestic purposes. The entire oolican harvest for the NAS is set aside for Aboriginal people, that is the NISCA nation and any other people who have an Aboriginal right to oolican in the area. The NISCA will also get input into management of the fishery through representation on a joint management committee. It will make recommendations to the minister. Aniska will also draft an annual plan for their own harvest to be approved by the minister. There are provisions uh, within the treaty for uh, tax of uh, the Nishka citizens. It's uh, brought in over a, a period of time, but ultimately they will uh, be in the same position as any uh, other person who doesn't live on a reserve. The Niska will pay sales tax after eight years and income taxes after 12 years. To generate its own revenue, the Niska government may eventually impose direct taxes on Niska citizens on Niska lands, and it may reach agreement with the province on imposing the same property taxes on non-Niska occupiers of Niska lands. The cash settlement in the Niska treaty is $190 million, to be paid over 15 years. In addition, the federal and provincial governments will provide ongoing fiscal transfers. They're intended to support services in the Nass Valley to comparable levels with those in northwestern B.C. The Niska government will have the ability to make laws and reach agreements with the federal and provincial governments covering a wide range of issues and services, such things as Niska citizenship, language and culture, public order, employment, child custody, social and health services, and education. However, many federal and provincial laws also apply to Niska citizens and lands. So how final will this treaty be if it's ratified? Negotiators have taken a new approach to that question. The treaty says it exhaustively sets out Niska rights and any other rights that may have been left out are released by the Niska. However, the deal does make provisions for some amendments. If we need changes, uh, if Certainly, it, it must be brought before our people via uh, a vote on, on whatever change may, may be required. 
certainly uh, the government of British Columbia and the government of Canada must also agree. There's a lot of hope for the future here. Many NISCA say this treaty holds the promise of economic opportunity, a chance for them to create badly needed jobs for their people. It might be a banner year for us. Uh, we also send a, a, what we call a super B of supplies, building supplies to Greenville alone. Uh, we didn't even have to lift a finger for that. So good for us. <laughs> um, we also supply Gitwin Sit with renovation material. We haven't as yet uh, supplied them with uh, building material, new construction material. There are currently 11 houses under construction in New Ianch, a much busier year than last. I tell you, this thing today has just opened up this valley. And so many people are coming here to see the beautiful place it is. We're going to get tourists. Our logging is depleted. We've got no logging to, or, as economy here. And I think tourism is going to be the answer to our, the success of this valley. And tourism is already picking up. The Lava Bed Park was created back in 1992. And while it's drawing many visitors to the area, attracting and sustaining development is something the Nishka haven't had a lot of experience with yet. What occurred today, I think, is the beginning of a process that enables our people to do certain things. We've never had the ability to do that before. They were denied us, denied the Aboriginal people not only in, in, in British Columbia, but right across the country. Many business people believe the NISCA Treaty will also benefit non-NISCA by providing certainty for investors, generating new economic activity, and bringing new money to the Northwest. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. The British Columbia Treaty Commission has published a number of reports modeling the financial and economic benefits of modern treaties for First Nations, British Columbians, and Canadians. In this final segment of Open Connection, Jerry Martin shares the benefits of treaty in neighboring communities. You know, the NISCA realized that there, you know, there are some commercial ventures that will survive up there, but to a large part, they, they're still going to have to do business in more major urban areas, and, 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 that, and that'll be good for us here. And I think there are lots of opportunities for joint venturing with them. What I see coming forward is, is a number of joint ventures that our businesses can get into with the Nishka uh, to promote various things. I, I see um, just excellent opportunities in the, in the area of tourism, where um, um, People from out of country would spend a few days in Terrace and then move on and spend a few days in, in the Nishka core lands. And uh, I think that bodes well for all of us. I see opportunities in the forest industry too because the timing for that is, is right. Uh, our, as far as I'm concerned, our forest industry is in somewhat disarray right now. So it's time to take a, a new look at this. But Tolstra admits there is a flip side to this potentially rosy picture. A number of forestry workers are going to be displaced, he says, and there will be job losses. And we will have to look uh, for other opportunities, maybe value-added opportunities, and uh, we can do that. Provincial and federal governments also feel the treaty will benefit non-NISCA and predict the effects could reach well beyond the Northwest. From my view, we're not talking about costs here, we're talking about investments. And indeed, the federal government is uh, a willing participant in settling land claim issues and building self-governments and making the investments that are necessary that will not only benefit the First Nations that we come to agreements with, but I believe all of the people of British Columbia. Financially, it's the only onload that BC is ever going to see from Ottawa that uh, is going to be about a half a billion dollars a year into the provincial economy, particularly the natural resource uh, and rural areas of, of British Columbia that are going to benefit. Uh, so it's, it's going to be not only the right thing to do to sign this treaty and other treaties, but it's going to be financially beneficial for, for all of us. Not everyone is embracing the treaty. There are some who have serious doubts. Among the skeptics, Skeena MP Mike Scott. It's going to result, in my view, in uh, very limited economic uh, opportunities and prosperity for individual NISCA people, 
the barriers to self-sufficiency uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the very things that have been that are holding the uh, individual Nisqaq people back from succeeding are not removed by this agreement. Uh, for example, there's no right to private property. And I'm talking about private property from an individual point of view. Everything is to be conveyed to the control and ownership of the Nisqaq central government. And three specific concerns are being raised by the Northwest Loggers Association. One of the first concerns and the utmost concerns that we seem to have is certainty. We would hope that the treaty process would provide certainty and we're not sure that it is because of the size of the document that it could lead itself to legal interpretations and various court challenges and the whatnot. And the other is fiber supply. We're not sure that under the treaty that a continued fiber supply for the area will be uh, attainable. And it's being predicted that non-Nishka in the fishing industry will also suffer losses. Uh, one is the level, the one is another is accounting. There is a fisheries committee made up that is going to be a management committee where third parties, recreational and commercial fishermen have, uh, have no place on. Uh, they will decide what surpluses are. There's the other question on what surpluses and who gets surpluses. So the whole thing was very badly managed from the gerrymandering at the start, uh, what the background numbers were, to how it was developed. And there are other people who have grave concerns about the treaty and its implications, including the eastern Aboriginal neighbours of the Niska. It's very clear that, the, that if anyone wants to sign a treaty, it's only going to be the Niska model. Um, I don't think from the, uh, the Premier's point of view there's going to be any other model and uh, from that point of view I can see why the Premier of the province uh, put all his big guns on this and went for it because he knew he was going to get a deal that was going to push Delgamook back and uh, I think from that perspective the Nishka should have been more vigilant. I mean there's the whole question of the certainty language which we understand is uh, consistent with the policy that, of the extinguishment and surrender. I think that we're quite concerned about that. The other matter is the, the 92 lands, the, all the 91, 24 lands will now be abandoned. Uh, that's a big concern to us. This is definitely not a done deal. Uh, Mr. Clark can say whatever he wants and he can run around patting himself on the back and, uh, and uh, Mr. Harry Nice can pat Mr. Dan Miller on the back and the uh, cafe and all that kind of stuff, but it's not a done deal. I don't care. That we're going to see legal challenges uh, sooner rather than later that are going to uh, maybe result in the provincial government having no option but to uh, provide a referendum. And a lot of that treaty is good, but there's a lot of it that's bad. And it should be straightened out and it should go to the people. There definitely should be a referendum. There shouldn't. If this treaty is not good enough to put to the people, then it's not good enough to fly. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictow.